to leave any questions or comments in the chat. So this is part one of a four part masterclass on the four generations. And this class is the four generations basics. So what do we mean by first four generations? It's a phrase that we hear all the time because we all know if, if you're a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you know that that's what we're asked to make sure that we start with with family history is to make sure we have our four generations quote unquote done, right? And this presentation does assume that you have a familysearch.org account. If you do not, no problem. You can get one for free. In fact, there are only free accounts. Um, there's no paid accounts. And so you go get a familysearch.org account if you don't have one because that's what we're focusing on. This class, I divided it into four level, or I'm sorry, five levels. So yes, there are four parts to the class. So there are going to be four different classes, but this one is divided into five levels because I didn't want people to feel like they had this huge long list of things that they had to do for their four generations. So who are your four generations? Who is your family? So for the per for our purposes, um, we're talking about working on our first four generations, starting with ourselves. So you are generation one, your parents are generation two, and you have two of those. Your grandparents are generation three, and you have four of those. And your great grandparents are generation eight, and you have eight of those. Now, you may be like me, where I have some bonus family. Due to adoption and divorce and remarriage, I, my family, my first four generations, is broader than it otherwise would be. I have more than 15 and you may be that way as well. So level one, remember I said there are going to be five levels. So the first level is the basics of the first four generations. When they say do your first four generations, what do they mean? Well, the first thing we want is the full birth names of the people in those generations. So you can see here and I, in this presentation, I used my family and um, some of my husband's family. So all of these people are my ancestors. So this is actually my grandmother and my great grandfather. You notice that I have her middle name. Um, her married name was Nash, but in Family Search, I'm always going to use a maiden name. If you do not know a maiden name, I know it sounds crazy, but don't put the married name in. Just leave that maiden name field blank. When you want to add in nicknames or titles, you scroll down to where it says other information and click add information. So many of us have ancestors who have added titles. Maybe they became a doctor or a minister and so they have the title reverend. Maybe they were in the military so they have a rank. Um, and in the case I'm going to show you now, the example I'm going to show you now is my grandfather who had a nickname. And so I click add information. And then for a nickname, I click alternate name, and then I click nickname. There's a drop down menu, and I can choose what kind of alternate name. And then I just type in his nickname, and I click, um, I choose a direction. I have to add in an explanation of why I put this in. And so I'm just saying it was a common nickname for him, right? I have personal knowledge of that because he was my grandpa, and I heard people call him that all the time and then I click save. So if you have family with a nickname, even if, even if you know that everybody knew them by that name, like nobody even knew their real name. Like I have a grandfather whose name was Luther and, but he always went by Tex. Nobody even called him Luther at all, but we still put him in as Luther in family search, but we add Tex as the nickname. All right. I want to give a little note about privacy here. And that is, so I'm showing, this is actually my father-in-law, and um, I'm showing the record from my husband's family search account and mine. So you'll notice that this is the same person, but there are two different family search ID numbers. The reason for that is that because of privacy, for anyone who is living, every single person who has a living person in the family tree will have a unique family search ID for that person. So even if you put that number in directly, like you type it in and you know you're typing it incorrectly, it'll, it'll pull up as not there. And the reason is privacy because they are alive. And then once 
um, when someone passes away, so for instance, my grandmother died a few years ago. When my grandmother died, all of us who had her in our family trees had different family search ID numbers for her. When she died, Family Search chose one of those numbers and they conflated all of the information into a single Family Search ID. And so then as soon as you mark the person as deceased in your family um, tree, in your login, then it will show that. Now, it can cause a problem for you because if you don't mark the person as deceased, it won't show the conflation. Like it won't show that it's connected to everybody. You will still have a different family search ID as everybody else. And I think I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think part of the reason is, is because it would not be a good thing to find out that someone close to you died because all of a sudden someone marked them deceased and that could happen. Right. And so they wait until you mark them deceased and then that merging, well, I don't like to use the word merge because that's a specific thing in family search, but that conflation into a single unification into a single family search ID will happen. The important part of this to understand is that you don't have to worry that you're going to put stuff in about yourself or your parents who are still living or maybe grandparents who are still living and, or even great grandparents who are still living and that other people are going to be able to see this private information. Family search keeps that private through the use of the unique ID. In addition to names, and I've talked a little bit about how to do that correctly, we're going to add in dates and places. So this is my truly beloved great aunt. And so I have the dates that she, the date she was born and died. And then the, this shows a place she was born. So what we want to make sure we do is fill the places out as completely as possible. So she was born in Cortland, Cortland County, New York State, United States. And then I, w I would rather have that than birth just saying New York, right? So be as full and complete and accurate as possible with place names. And then you're gonna want to standardize them. When a place name or date is not standardized, Family Search will let you know in a big red background white exclamation mark symbol that you will see. And when you look at dates and places, you will see this red exclamation mark here. And that red exclamation mark says, okay, that's not standard. So how do you do that? You, you will see it like this. See how that looks? You'll see it under research help. Missing standardized birthplace. It can do it for places and dates. So the same thing is true. You're going to standardize them. So what you do is you click on standardize and it says no standard selected, right? So all you have to do is start typing and it will start repeating what's already there and it will pop up with suggestions and then you can click on those and it will then be standardized. Interestingly, I found this one on my mother-in-law. I didn't have her in a standard. And then it will show that it's standard. So see standardized place. And then it will say reason this information is correct. And I just say standardized. That's all I say. I just went ahead and standardized it. So standardization is important for dates and for places. And the reason that it's important is because it helps the computer's algorithm work. It lets the system know, okay, this is where this person was. And so we can look for records for the person and that will help the system decide whether records it finds are related to this person, are possible sources of information for this person. And so you want it to be standard. You don't want it to be something that's a uncommon abbreviation or something that got put in that isn't quite right or isn't what the computer would recognize. So let me give you an example. One of the things that you can do is go through all the people and standardize their residence in 1935. Anybody who was alive in 1935 and who has a 1940 census attached as a source will need their 1935 residence standardized. And the reason is that on the 1940 census, it asked the question, hey, where did you live in 1935? And one of the answer choices was same place. And if they put that, then the family search, when you added the 1940 census in as a source, family search said same place as the location. But obviously that's not the name of the town, right? So what you're gonna do is just look at where they were living in 1940. So you can see here, residence 1940. Then I just type that in. I just start typing in Baldwinsville, Van Buren town, 
and then it will fill it in and standardize it. So yeah, oh, 1940 census, <laughs> oh, 1940 census. But that's all you have to do to standardize it and it really will help your sources come in more accurately and more frequently. You want to add sources for all of those dates and places. How do you know where they were born and where they died? And how do you know when they were born and when they died or when they were married? So we're looking for specifically dates of birth, marriage, and death. That's where we're going to start. And so you have to say how you know that. Now, if it is you, you may say personal knowledge, right? I know this is my birthday or I know that's where I was born or um, if it was your mother, right? I know that she died on this day. But what's best is if you can have documentary evidence of that. So one of the difficult things with family history is saying, well, where do I find that? And truly, the possibilities are almost endless. And it it's beyond the scope of what we're doing here, although I think after this series is done, that may be where we go back to. But in the meantime, what I have for you is a big, huge genealogy source checklist that has pages and pages of possible places where you can find sources of the information that you are looking for, the birth, marriage, and death dates and places of your first four generations. So you can download that at this link. Here's something else. At the end of this presentation, I'm going to give you a link to a handout that goes along with this presentation. That handout has all the steps I'm talking about. It has any resources I'm mentioning. It has this link and every other I'm talking about. In addition to that handout, which is two pages long and you'll be able to save it or print it out, whatever you prefer, or both, right? In addition to that, this recording will also be available and I will put a lot of information in the description for the recording. So don't worry that if I go over something too fast that you're going to miss it forever. You can always go back and watch the recording and you can always look at the handout and obviously you can always ask questions in the comments and I'll make sure I find them. The next thing um, in this step is to follow. Now they've just recently changed the word of this. It used to be called watch and they changed it to follow. And I think they wanted to make it sound nicer because if you go to change information on someone that other people are following, it used to say, do you really want to do this? Eight people are watching you. And now it says eight other people are following, which is kind of a kinder, gentler way to say it. But you see the difference here. If you're not following, the, the star will be hollow and it will say follow. You click there on that star and then it will look like this. So you can tell if you're following because the star will be filled in and it will say following. You want to do that. Now, not only do you want to follow, but you also want to check in. So let me show you what I mean by that. Under your notifications in your family search account, which you find with the bell, click on the bell and it will show you changes to people you follow. And you can see how mine have been clicked. Like this bold, this bold shows that I haven't clicked on that one yet. It was the wedding anniversary apparently of my third great grandparents. Um, but you can see that these are clicked. And the reason is that I check that all the time. I go in and check that because what it shows me is this. It shows me what has been changed. And so I can click, I see the person and I click view activity and then it tells me what happened. An alternate name was changed. And what it also tells me is who changed it. That's what this arrow is pointing to. It tells me who changed it. Why is that useful? Because if I click on that name, then I get this, send a message. So when you follow, it does two things for you. First of all, it makes sure that nobody messes up the correct information that you've put in, right? Like nobody adds something that's wrong because if they do, you know. Now, in addition to checking the notifications, Family Search will send you emails, but it's good practice to check those notifications and see if there have been changes made to people you follow. 
One little thing you should know is that if you have ancestors in your family who are famous or well-known, there will be lots and lots and lots of changes to them. So I'm a descendant of Mary Warren, who was a child of a Mayflower passenger, and for some reason, people are constantly wanting to change stuff about Mary Warren, even though she died in the 1600s. So know that if you are related to someone at all well-known, you're going to get a lot of notifications. Now, the second reason, in addition to keeping things accurate, is this you can send a message to the person who made the change. And I have found so many cousins through this because I'll just send a little message and say, hey, I noticed that you updated Adolf Dolphing. He's my great grandfather. I was wondering, are we cousins? And then I've got, I have found a second cousin who I didn't know that way. So I strongly recommend following and I also recommend following up with the following. All right, that's level one. Now we got four, we have four levels to go. That's level one. Those are the first steps. Do those things first. Once you've done those things, then we're going to move on to level two. The first part of level two is to share sources. Now this is only available. Excuse me. I'm going to cough for just a second. <coughs> Sorry. This is only available if you have an LDS partner access account with ancestry. So if you do, you can seamlessly share sources from Ancestry to Family Search and um, back. So you can make sure that all the information that you have in Ancestry matches what's in Family Search and that all the sources that are cited in one place are also listed in the other. So this is like, you can see this is the name, this is my great great grandfather, and you can see this, the white tree is not, if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, this is not the white tree of Gondor. This is a white tree that shows this has been done. This Everything that's been done, this person is connected and everything's done. So if it's not been done, I had to go hunt around. I had to find my third great aunt before I could find someone who I had not connected into Family Search. And if you do that, you'll see a green tree. Instead of white, you'll see green, as in you have an opportunity here to make a connection. To do it, you just click it and it, it will usually tell you that your family search authorization has expired. No problem. Just click sign in and log in using your family search information, like your family search account information, and then it will pull up this screen. When it pulls up this screen, then you get the choice. It will populate. You can see here at the top, it will populate two possible people. It thinks, are in family search that might be the person that you have in ancestry. And if it is, you just click, if one of them is correct, or if they, if, or if you see one that you recognize as being the same person, then you can click on that person. And you can see that in addition to, um, there, there, you can view them on family search. You can add relatives from family search, meaning that if this person had, spouse or children or parents in family search who were not in ancestry i can do that right from here and i can disconnect them as well so there are a number of things that you can do there now if you see here this arrow that means that you've connected the person but there's still stuff to do and when i click i see oh okay i need to do some comparing so when we compare people in ancestry and family search the um, family search populates on the left, ancestry on the right. And whatever is different, it will, it will show. So I clicked over here because they had a better birth in ancestry, or I'm sorry, a better birth date in family search than in ancestry. So I clicked it and then it will show. And then I can even come down here and it will list the sources. If the source is only over here. It means it's in Ancestry, but it's actually not in Family Search. I can check these boxes and then it will put them in Family Search as a source. And so then in Family Search, if I pulled that person up and I looked at sources, these sources would be listed even though they were actually attached to the Ancestry family tree. Now, once you've done all the clicking you want to make sure that all the information you want to do is shared, then you need to make sure that you save your changes. If you don't save your changes, then they won't save, <laughs> right? So you want to do that. Now, what if you go to log in and you're like, I don't know if this is the right John Drury. I don't know if either of these are correct. Then 
pause, go to family search, look these FSID numbers up and see if you can tell that it's the right person or not. And you may find that they are the same, these, both of these are the same person and they need to be merged, right? That's possible. But it's also possible that neither of these are correct and you need to add it. Like there is no match. The person is not already in family search. If they're not already in family search, you will have to create a person before you can connect them to ancestry. The next thing I would say is that you would do under step two is to create or add a life sketch. So life sketch is this. So this is my grandfather. And when I go to his person page, I can see the details down here, but right here it says life sketch. If I click that black arrow, it will expand the life sketch and then it will look like this. So my suggestion would be to make sure that all of the people in your four generation charts have life sketches, at least to some extent, right? So here for my grandfather, it just has a paragraph. Some people will just copy and paste in the obituary. I don't necessarily recommend just doing that. I would suggest if you put in the obituary, that's fine, but also add some personal information because obituaries, especially um, because they can be expensive, may not have information as much about the person's life as they do about funeral arrangements and the survivors. And so put a little something about who this person was. Just to do those 15 life sketches is very, very, very useful. So do the life sketch. If you're LDS, you will definitely want to focus on ordinances. So if it's, if there's a green icon that looks like a temple, it means that there are ordinances available. That does not mean that, the, that those ordinances really are available to be done. It just means that somebody in either these, this couple or their children has ordinance work that has not been completed. So um, this color, the blue means it's been reserved, like it's in progress and work has been reserved. So um, because of the sacred nature of temple ordinances, I'm not going to go deeply into that in something that's going to appear on YouTube, but I would suggest that if you have questions about how that works, that you check with your, your family history consultant in your ward if it's not me. <laughs> and if it is me, then talk to me, right? The next thing I would do is to add in notes and discussion. And the way that you do that is on the collaborate tab. So this is my great grandfather, one of my great grandfathers, and I click collaborate and I can add things. So in collaborate, if I want to share something with people, I add a note. You see here, add a note. I can click new note. So I added a note saying, you know what? There is actually another Arthur Lewis Gates who was born in the same town at almost the same time and it's very easy to confuse them. Here's how to tell them apart, right? That's a note. It will help other people. One of the really great things about notes and discussions is that people can't change them. Other people can go in, because this is a crowdsourced family tree, people can make changes to it. But in the notes and comments, and in the notes and the discussions, and then the comments on the notes and discussions, only administrators or the person who made it can delete it or change it. And so that's why I have this lock here, right? Kind of locks it in. So especially if there's any confusion in your family, be sure to, to share in notes and um, the discussion questions. And I'll show a little bit more about that later. I strongly suggest at this level that you add image memories. So these are images that I've added to my father's memories and times that he was in the Navy. Now, in addition to sending them to family search, I also went and found that there's a website that is for people who served in the Navy on the same destroyer that he served on. I sent those images to them as well and then they added them in. And what that does is, well, not only is it helpful, right? You're being a good digital citizen, but it also means that if people are searching online, they're more likely to find uh, things about my dad. And so I'm trying to create a living memory of my family. And it isn't just on family search and isn't just on ancestry. If there are other places that are having a history of a, a town, you'll find this sometimes, towns, military units, um, extended family websites, 
these are places where you may also want to share your image memories. All right, that's level two. Now, don't forget, you're going to get a handout with a whole checklist with all of this stuff. You don't have to remember. And also remember that if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to put them in the chat. I can see the chat. Okay, so level three, let's get personal. Part of your four generations is you. So in your own person page, make sure that you are adding to your own story. Make sure that you are adding in your own life sketch. Make sure that you're adding in pictures. You are probably the person, unless possibly your parents, who has the most access to photographs of you. And if you add them in, you get the ones you like, right? So be sure to flesh out your own story that is part of your family history. You know, it's it's a hard thing to talk about, but the truth is, is that none of us know how much time we have. And if we wait until we think, oh, well, now I've been working on the rest of my family, now I'll do me. You know, everybody's me is someone else's parent or grand. When my grandmother died, if I had been able to look at her family search person page and see things that she herself had said, what a wonderful record that would have been. So please don't hesitate to add to your own story. And if you ever find yourself feeling frustrated or discouraged in working in family history because you can't find something that you want or you're getting conflicting information, then my suggestion to overcome that frustration is to go back to your own story and add in something, even if it's just a little anecdote from some crazy thing that happened to you in junior high. The next thing I would suggest is to correct errors found in other places. So I have a great, great, great grandfather, yes, three greats, who was um, in the Civil War and his name was Ira Milton Floyd. Shockingly, there were two Ira Milton Floyds who served in the Civil War and they are constantly confused. That's why I put the hashtag like to lose my mind because in Ancestry, everybody has it wrong in family search, it was all wrong. And so in this level, I would suggest correct errors that are found in other places. And the way I would suggest to do that is in the collaborate in notes. So I mentioned people can't change this, right? So I added this whole note and if I opened it up, you would see it's like this long. <laughs> it's like, this is how I know that there are two different Ira Milton Floyds and how you can tell them apart. And these are the sources for this one. And these are the sources for that one, right? But you see, there are two different Ira and Floyds, please read. So anybody coming to Ira Milton Floyd's page will then see this hopefully if they click on collaborate. So if you go to someone's page in your family and you see a little number here next to collaborate, definitely go read those to see what other people have said. The next thing I would say is go sideways. So if you have, um, you may wanna go to your spouse or in this case, this is a beloved great aunt of mine. My aunt Norma never had any children of her own and I loved her like she was another grandmother to me. and. I, I have so many memories of her, but when you go to her person page, you actually can't tell that. I haven't taken the time to write a good life sketch of her. I haven't shared any memories I have of her other than some pictures. And anybody going to this page of my Aunt Norma would never have a clue of how loved she was and how treasured the memories of her are. And so one of the things that you can consider is are there aunts or uncles or maybe family who died before they had children, right? Anybody who you care deeply about in your family, who you feel that you can honor their memory by making their profile, their person page more filled out and deeper so that other people too can get to know how wonderful they were. One of the best ways to do this is the next step, which is to give it sound. So in the Memories tab, you can choose Audio. Now my suggestion really is to do this not through the website, which it looks like this on the website. In order to do in the website, you have to either um, upload, you have to record it and then upload it to FamilySearch. However, if you get the app on your phone, now this is not 
the Family Search Family Tree app. This is the Family Search Memories app. And I have a link to the app in the handout that you're going to get. So don't worry about that. But this app is so useful. Let me show you. I took a couple screenshots of it in my phone today. So this is what it looks like. When you go to the app, you can add in all kinds of images. You can see the life stories. You can see all kinds of stuff. So it looks like this. When you open the app, it'll look like this. So these are pictures like this is, I know this is Grandpa Munson. This is my great, great step, great, great grandfather. I can see all, all these different people. I can see clippings, all these memories that I've added. All right, that's what the app looks like. When you want to add a memory from the app, you just click one of these icons to add a memory and you can add images. Like you can just be taking a picture of a document. You can take a picture of um, a picture. You can, you can scan stuff in right from your phone or if you have a tablet and you can do it right from this app. For audio, for audio, the app is way easier than desktop because once you click that you want to add an audio file, which is just that little microphone, you can record right into your phone. You don't have to upload a file. You can record right in. When you click that, it's going to give you all these prompts like questions. And these are about yourself. So these are questions it's asking to help you get started on recording audio memories of your own life. But if you don't want to do that, you, you don't have to, right? Especially if you're recording a memory of someone else. And so you just click, no, I'm going to go ahead and start recording. And so I can tell a story and then attach it right to the person from my phone. What a great, easy way this is to do family history. I can be driving down the street and just talking to my phone, telling a story about something that happened. I could think about, I could easily do it right now, telling a story about my Aunt Norma and how she always used to send me $5 on my birthday and how excited I would get always to get my $5 from Aunt Norma and I still have all those cards that she sent me and just getting something said, love Aunt Norma and Uncle Len, always getting those cards. And I remember that she had this boxer dog and I, just little memories of Aunt Norma that I can do seriously while I'm driving, while I'm cooking dinner, anything. I love the Memories app. I would definitely suggest doing it. The next thing I would suggest in this level is to make sure that your family tree is not just in Family Search or Ancestry. They are on the internet, right? They are someone else's computer. And so one of the suggestions I would have is to make sure that your family tree is in a desktop or at, l at the very least that you've printed out what's important because things will change. I think having a desktop family tree is essential because that is controlled by you. Now, I, I'm not really going to share the one I use because it costs money, but I have two free options for you. The first one is Roots Magic has Roots Magic Essentials, which is a free desktop family tree program. You do not have to buy it. Of course, they're going to ask you to, but you don't have to buy the paid version of it. And Roots Magic is a very popular program among genealogists. You probably, if you know anybody who's into family history, you probably know somebody who uses Roots Magic and they have a free version. The website MyHeritage that is probably best known for being one of the DNA sites also has a free genealogy program that you can do and it's called Family Tree Builder. So either of those two are are programs that you can do to, to do your own family tree. Next, I suggest, this may seem kind of paranoid, but I suggest taking screenshots every now and then. Not that long ago, because it's a crowdsourced tree, and not that long ago, I logged into Family Search and saw that something looked a little wonky with my grandmother. And I went to go look and found that somebody had done something crazy and almost everything was gone. And a lot of it was able to be restored, but there are a few pieces of information that Family Search couldn't even get for some reason. You know, it's technology, right? It doesn't always work perfectly. And if I had had screenshots of what it looked like before, I would have been able to get them to fix it. But because I couldn't prove it, we just have to start from scratch. And sometimes that can take a lot of time. So every now and then, for people you're close to or for people who are vulnerable to being messed with by other people, my suggestion would be to take some screenshots and save them just in a file that says screenshot and then name the screenshot who the person was. I would say you don't need to do this very often, but it is helpful. Every time I would make a major change, maybe I would do that. All right, level four. 
bring your four generations to life. How do you do this? Now remember, if you're watching and you have any questions or comments, please feel free to put them in the chat. I'm happy to answer any questions or comments. We're perfectly fine for time and I want to make sure if you have any questions that they get answered. Um, so how do you bring your tree to life? My first suggestion is one thing you can do is add in a little bit of information if you've done any DNA testing. So the way that you do that is that you click on other information just like when you were adding a nickname. And then all the way down at the bottom, you have to scroll all the way to the bottom, way down here, it says custom fact. And so, but look at, you can see the ones above this, you can add in a physical description, which I think is kind of cool, right? So there are lots of, if you go scroll through other information, you will find like, that's where you can put in military stuff, you can put in health stuff, you can put in all kinds of stuff. So I, I told my husband when I was working on this, that I found so many things I could do, right? I can put in a physical description of my grandfather. I could not even just from my own memory. I have his World War II draft registration, which is kind of funny because he was profoundly deaf and his draft registration card didn't even say that. Like you think they'd want to know that, right? But he, um, but on his draft registration card, it had his height and weight and it had his, it has draft registration cards have hair color, eye color and skin tone. And so you can have, you can put all that in, right? Which is interesting. But if you click on custom fact, then you can say whatever you want. And so, well, let me go back to a second. Why would you want to put something in about DNA? One of the things you can say about DNA is something along the lines of if the person has used GEDmatch, which is like a, um, a, a place, it's a website where people upload their ancestry, their DNA kits, they, they upload their DNA information and then it like crowdsources it and you can do a lot more powerful analysis with it. So if you use GEDmatch, you could put your GEDmatch kit there so that then if people find it, like your, your grandfather's or any deceased person, if they find the GEDmatch kit, then they can go find that person and see if they're related genetically. Um, in my situation where there's adoption, then I've used DNA a lot to prove connections and so I can put that in as a note like DNA match right the way that this was determined was through a DNA match between two people who shared this many centum organs or whatever the other thing I can do is if there's a question in a family right like well we're not really sure if the child belonged to like an unknown paternity event um, then DNA may solve that and you could put that in as a custom fact right DNA um, a test done by so-and-so has proven that so-and-so is, you know, this is the known paternity or, or whatever. So there are lots of possible things that you might want to do with DNA. You also could add in like centimorgans that they share with different people. All right, next, add maps and images of places. So this is in step four, but it's really one of my favorite things to do is to add maps and images of places, not just people. So for instance, um, this is the back of my Aunt Alice's house. The last time I visited her, and she passed away this year, but the last time that I went to visit her last year, um, I took a picture of the back of her house because I remember all growing up, going and having cookouts in Aunt Allie's backyard. And a lot of the stories that I have of my family took place in that backyard. And if you have a picture, it anchors the story. People can imagine what it looked like to be back behind this house. I also took a picture of the Seneca River. This is at Lock 24 on the Erie Canal. And my family, my grandma was raised right on that canal. And so when she tells stories about my Aunt Elsie floating down the river, it's nice to have pictures of what that was. So not only do they anchor the story, but they also confirm your sources. So when I am having sources that say they move from here to here, and if I, and it, like they move three miles away from here to here, and then I go get a map of Broome County, New York, and I see, oh, okay, it, the map says it's like 32 miles, so what's going on, right? Then I might have a question, but if the map coincides with what they say, it's confirmation. They also can confirm the source of like when I, there's a story of my Aunt Elsie who not only fell down the river or flew down the river, floated down the river, but she also was jumping on a bed and jumped out of the second story of this house. And so 
if I found a picture of the house and found that it only had one story, then I would know there's no way that Aunt Elsie jumped out in the second story because she was in a one-story house. But yes, indeed, there is a second story window that looks out over the driveway. So that kind of confirms the story that she jumped out of the window and landed in the driveway. You had to know my Aunt Elsie. <laughs> okay, maps. Oh, how I love you, Sanborn maps. So in 1885, this, the Sanborn Fire Insurance Company did these maps and they are so detailed and so amazing. They are just wonderful. They listed all the streets, but not only that, all the buildings and what was in the building. What's fascinating to me is that some of these buildings now, of course, no longer exist, but my grandmother lived in this building. It's listed as a tenement and it was torn down. It was destroyed. Um, however, I found it on the map. And so when my grandmother was trying to describe to me where she lived, I pulled up the Sanborn map and I'm like, well, look at this map, grandma. Like, does it look like it might be this house? And she was like, oh yeah. And she was able to tell me, oh yeah. And then we moved to this house and the so-and-sos lived here and the so-and-sos lived here. And I cannot tell you if you had family in the United States in the late 1880s, in the late 1800s, Sanborn fire maps, the Sanborn maps. Now, luckily and beautifully, the Sanborn maps are all available for free through the Library of Congress and a link is in the handout that I'm going to give you. But the Sanborn fire maps are a treasure. The next thing I would suggest is look for some newspaper articles. So the Library of Congress, again, has a site called Chronicling America where they have tons and tons and tons of newspaper articles. I just recently went on there and found the article where Abraham Lincoln issued the first proclamation for Thanksgiving. But I've also found lots of interesting articles about my own family. Now, the more well-known your family is, or the more there, more of those newspapers that have made it available, the more you'll find for free there. But I found a couple. I found an article about my great uncle Carl, who was trying to get into the Navy and that there was an article that he passed a physical fitness test. Remember that, that newspapers were the social media of their day. And a lot of times they would say, so-and-so went and visited so-and-so and so-and-so -so had a birthday party. There's an article in the newspaper about my father's two-year-old birthday party. So that they don't do that really anymore, but you can find these. Um, there was an article here about my my great uncle Kenny who died on his wedding night in a car crash and there was an article about it so you can find those the next thing and in the in the handout I have lists of a couple places to get newspaper articles the next thing I would suggest is to solicit memories from family call them up talk to them in person reach out and ask why there are different versions of the same story I have heard at least four versions of the story of my, of how my um, uncle, I'm sorry, how my great uncle found a cigar box full of money in the river. And then what happened to that money? I've heard four versions of it. I have heard um, different versions of many different stories. And the more versions you hear, you can either put all the versions in or when you're writing up the story, you can say, you know, according to so-and-so, it was this, or according to so-and-so, it was that. And that makes your story more credible. Next, it can strengthen relationships. I have wonderful conversations with my great aunt Betty um, and my great aunt Kate, who are still alive. And I talk with them, they're in their 90s, and I call them and say, can you tell me again about Aunt Elsie jumping out the river, right, or out the window, or floating down the river, or, can you tell me again about how, um, you know, they found the money or just, um, what was it? What was, when you got married, what was it like or whatever? And I just, the more I learn her stories, the more I get close to my aunt Betty. And even though I feel like I couldn't be any closer to her, I am. And part of it is because we have these conversations about her life. <laughs> the next thing I would say is third time's a charm. So my uh, grandfather, one of my grandfathers was raised by his cousin, actually, he thought it was his aunt, but it turned out to be his cousin, was raised by his cousin because he was severely burned as a child. He pu pulled a pot of boiling water over on himself and she was a nurse. And so he went and lived there. So she cared for him. 
So he wasn't close to his parents. And when I started doing family history in earnest, um, he was deceased and my grandmother didn't even remember anything about his parents, you know, and she had not seen them since 1941. <laughs> and so she didn't remember, she didn't remember, she remembered my great grandmother's first name, but that was it. And so I would ask her, you know, are you, have you, can you remember anything? No. Okay. A couple years later, do you remember anything? No. Okay. <laughs> and then one night, one night, it was nine o'clock at night in Texas and my grandmother lived in New York. And, um, so it's an hour later. And one night I had the feeling you need to call your grandma and ask her about your great grandmother. And I thought, mm, no, not going to call my grandma at 10 o'clock at night because my grandma goes to bed about seven. <laughs> and if you're going to call her at 10 o'clock at night, uh, her actual house needs to be on fire. So I was like, no, I'm not going to call. I'll call her in the morning. But I had this strong, strong, strong impression. No, you need to call her right now. And I was like, mm, let me think about it. Nope. <laughs> so no. And then third time you need to call your grandmother. And I was thinking, how can this be important right now? I have asked her at least six or seven times for anything she might remember about them. And she knows nothing. Why does it matter to ask her in the morning versus now? But I had the strong feeling, call her now. And so I called my grandmother at 10 o'clock at night. I woke her up and I said, I know this is going to sound crazy, grandma. I know this is going to sound crazy, but is there any possibility that you remember anything about grandpa's parents? And she said, that's so weird that you would call. She said, today I was going through an old cookbook and your great grandmother's obituary fell out of the cookbook. I threw it away and I, she said, I put it out for the trash and it's out at the curb. And I'm like, she said, I'm glad you called tonight because they'll be here at five in the morning. So she went out and she dug it out of the trash and that was how I found the names and dates and places, everything I needed for my great grandparents. So have those conversations, have them over and over. Now, not to the point that you're annoying the people, but, and not to the point that you're being rude, but just because the answer is no one time doesn't mean it's always going to be no. Level five, source and extend. Now, some of the things that I'm talking about today, I'm going to be covering in more depth in future classes. So we're going to get way more into sources and we're going to get way more into memories. But for now, I want to share some ideas about sources. Next class, the next class is a deep dive into sources. So the first thing I would say is organize those sources. So if you look at a list of sources, you can see Oh, oh, you know what's ironic? This is that great grandmother, Grace Esther Parkinson. That's that's that great grandmother I was just talking about that her obituary was in the trash. So you can see all these sources and they don't have any dates here and they're just all messed up. You can organize those sources to make it easier on everybody because look how many sources she had. She had like over 20 sources and they're just a big long list. So one of the things you can do is put in dates. So if the source has a date, it looks like this. If it doesn't have a date, it looks like this and you can click and add. So you may have to view the source in order to see what year it was, but then you can, once you know it, add it. Once you've added the source year, then you can do this. You can order them by date and it's so easy. You just drag them. You just click over here where the date is and just drag it up into the I have put all of her resources. I've put dates on all of them and I've put them all in order. Why is this handy? Because I can easily look through these sources and see, you know what? There's a big gap in years. Like what documents might exist that would show what she was doing between this year and this year? Like for instance, here's a glaring omission, 1905 census, 1915 census. Where's the 1910 census? And so I should be able to go get that. And well, this isn't a census, this is a marriage, but New York took a state census in 1905. So that's what that is. But I'm missing the 1910 US federal census. And so when you order them by date, you see what's missing. I strongly suggest adding dates and then ordering by date. And you know what, let, let me say one more thing about that. That is a great task for kids. That's a great task for youth. Um, the memories are great for younger kids and I'm gonna be talking about that in a future class. But organizing sources 
putting in the dates and putting them in the right order is a great task for kids as young. It depends on the child, but probably by 10 years old for sure. Next, be sure to attach the source to all the people on the record. And if you haven't done so, Family Search will give you this warning. This source has not been attached to all people found on the record. Now to do that, you may have to add people into Family Search, but that's the next place to look. So if you are looking for something to do in your first four generations, look at all the people, look at their sources, and see if any of them need to be attached. The next thing I would suggest is to leverage Find a Grave. So Find a Grave is owned by Ancestry. It is not connected to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but it is a wonderful website. One of the most underused features that it offers is the opportunity to create a virtual cemetery. This is totally free. This is totally free. You, don't, you, need, you need an account to do this, but the account is free. There's no paid version. So you'll see here the Alfred Gates and Lucretia Tubbs family, and it says virtual cemetery. If you click on it, this is what you get. You will get all of these people who are descendants of Alfred Gates and Lucretia Tubbs. They are buried in different cemeteries. You can see this person is buried in New Jersey. This person is buried in Onondaga County, New York. This person is buried in Cortland County, New York, and they are all related. And so if your family is spread apart, you can gather your family together in a virtual cemetery. I love virtual cemeteries. You can create virtual cemeteries for all of the family who may be buried in military cemeteries. You can do all of the ones who are buried outside of the United States, right? So there are lots of different things that you can do. It's so fantastic. Another thing I recommend is that you can favorite cemeteries. So you, if you have cemeteries that a lot of your family is buried in, you can put those in as favorite cemeteries. And so when I log into my account and I click on my profile, I can go choose one of these cemeteries and I can go directly to that seminary, cemetery rather than like clicking around and around and around because a lot of information will be there about my family that I might want to update. Next, and, and this is last, order more records. So once you have done what you can with what's publicly available and you still want to get into it more, then my suggestion would be order more records. So some of the records that might exist for your family who is deceased would be their social security application, their original social security application. You can order that for genealogical purposes if you are a direct descendant. It does cost a little bit of money and the money amount varies depending on how, um, how like certified you want it, how, how off, I don't know the word, official, I guess, that you want it. But you can order Social Security um, and you can order, oh, let me go back here. You can order passport applications. You can order military records. And so order things that might not be there. I've ordered, this isn't in my four generations, but I've ordered my third great grandfather's Civil War records, um, pension records from the Civil War. And it came and it was like 25 pages long. It had death certificates, marriage certificates, birth certificates in it. So order more records that you can use to strengthen and deepen, broaden your family tree. So I hope that from this class, you have learned there is no such thing as done. <laughs> there is no such thing. When, because new records are being found all the time, People might be making little mistakes that you need to fix. There's always the opportunity to add to life sketches. There's always the opportunity to add to memories. There are always the opportunities to do things with the sources. I hope that you found this useful and that you found some things that's maybe sparked some ideas in you of things that you can do to make your first four generations more complete and more fleshed out and a better record of your family. So here's the handout. If you go to bit.ly slash 4gen handout, you will be able to get a two page long handout with all of the different links I talked about and all of the steps, all of the steps listed out there as a checklist. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to make a comment. Now we're gonna, um, well, the live stream won't be going on anymore, but you can always leave a comment, reach out in the handout 
There is a link to where you can join in the Facebook group if you want for Family History for Everyone. And we'll be back in one week to do the next session, which will be all about resources. Thank you so much for joining. I look forward to seeing you next.